Promo Insiders, an ASI media podcast that covers the topics that matter most to the promotional products industry. I'm senior writer John Corrigan, and today I'm joined by Dan Thurman, president of Motivation Works. Dan helps organizations and individuals implement action plans and stay at the top of their game during crucial times. There's been no time more crucial than what we've been living in over the past year. An ASI show favorite, Dan will be the keynote speaker during ASI Chicago on July 14th. Dan, thanks for joining me. How are you? John, I'm very, very well, and I'm very excited to be with you and can't wait for Chicago. Listen, Chicago, will will this be the like the largest gathering that you've been to since the pandemic began? Yes, it will, in fact. We, I've done some smaller meetings, and there's several between now and then as well. But um, uh, it's going to be great to be in front of a large audience. And I'm just so... Um, you know, you know, some of your questions are, are about the disruption and the way we've learned to do business differently. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to being back in something so fun and familiar. Absolutely. Uh, well, let, let, let's talk about the pandemic a little bit here. How has it affected your, your business and, and really your, your life? Well, I would say overall in very positive ways, both for our business and for me personally. When I think about the business and the the events of the last year, my last three dates last year were March 7th, 8th, and 9th, and they were in Israel, Nashville, and Dallas, back to back, those three days. And so that's how my schedule used to be. I've been, I was on planes every single week going to all these different events for stages, for audiences, for big events like this one. But, you know, all of that evaporated in an instant, like everyone, when lockdown happened, when COVID hit, when we all kind of settled in for this long stretch. Now, the reality was people still needed my message and my teaching more than ever. So one of the things we did, and we were already positioned well, we had already kind of started moving in this direction, but we really leaned into our virtual capabilities and we we um, fully flushed out a, th- a full broadcasting studio to do live events with three different sets, five different cameras, and the full complement of everything that I do, because kind of my distinction and differentiation is to deliver in a big way uh, with mind, body, and spirit, and the full physicality of what I do. And so we did that virtually as well, and it was a huge differentiator. And so for me, um, and for a lot of my clients, it was a huge reset, and it gave everyone who was uh, really committed to different differentiation an opportunity to uh, to go forward in a new way, to to reach new audiences and to force some innovation that was uh, necessary. And and that's what we did. Now, personally, um, obviously, I got to spend a lot more time at home with my family. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed a lot more of the disciplines that were close to home. I got to see a whole season from start to finish. I mean, <laughs> spring of last year, it was like crazy watching the the plants bloom every single day and like the whole spring. And it, I realized I hadn't experienced that in decades. Wow. And that was crazy. Um, and then it, it just as, a, as a, another interesting aside, my daughter Maggie is a TikTok um, star. Wow. You know, basically through the pandemic, she grew her, her following from a few thousand people to now over 4 million. Oh. And part oh. of that, part of that whole journey is, uh, our dances and comedy sketches and things that we do together as a father daughter. Okay. And so, so it, that grew my, uh, my influence in a big way among a, a younger generational audience and launched my daughter's career and our career together such that we're doing a podcast and, and all kinds of other opportunities that just would not have existed had it not been for the pandemic. So, um, you know, I just say it's all part of the master plan and, and I'm, Grateful to go along for the ride. That's awesome. Especially, you know, your daughter able to, I like, like, like many of the people in our industry, able to kind of use the pandemic to, you know, reinvent themselves or, or to grow themselves and, and to really kind of take advantage of this terrible situation, but to make the most of it. That's very inspiring. We um, heard that over and over again from our audiences. You know, we always ask, what's the, what's the hardest thing that you've been through? We asked this to a whole group and, and virtually we can do this from a distance and we see a word cloud develop of all these incredible challenges and experiences and, and some of them quite severe, including the loss of loved ones and, and things that are just so heart wrenching. But then on the other side of that, you ask them the question, how are you better now as a result of this experience? And you see a whole different story unfold with words of 
I, I'm stronger, I'm better, I'm more resilient, I'm more flexible, I'm closer to my family, I'm in better shape, whatever it may be, I'm more grateful. And I think yeah. we're all just, we have such a different sense of appreciation and gratitude for all the things we took for granted. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned earlier about the physicality that you bring to your presentations. For people that, you know, don't know, your presentations include acrobatics, juggling, and a unicycle. Uh, it, it's it's <laughs> unbelievable what you're able to, to, to provide to, to attendees. How have you been able to maintain this fitness regimen? I mean, you know, gyms were closed down for a while and, and things like that. Were, were you were you able to maintain your fitness regimen? Yes. So, uh, fortunately, my fitness regimen nev was never dependent upon a gym. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I have a lot of daily disciplines to keep my skills sharp, to keep myself engaged. And, you know, I, I basically think of health as something I'm aligned to rather than something I have to go do. So I'm constantly moving and trying different things, and I have so many different ways to stay active. One of my favorite um, uh, challenges is to go off-road unicycling. And so it's okay. one wheel on a, on a mountain unicycle, which is a, a big knobby tire, and you go into the woods, and you're climbing mountains and hills and, <laughs> and going through rivers. And it's, a, it's an incredible challenge, but it also focuses you on just being in the moment because it is so hard. And so you're constantly working these problems as you turn every corner. And, and for me, that was a big, big discipline. Um, and then, you know, just here in the studio, we would constantly be presenting and doing shows and things like that. So we like one of the things I'm known for is to do handstands on the lecterns and do handstand pushups. And um, I continue to do all of that. And of course, TikTok also played a part in that as well because Maggie and I did so many dances. I did, I've done more dancing, John, than I've ever done in my entire life <laughs> in the past uh, year and a half. It's been crazy. So yeah, so I feel good. And for me, that's important because not just it's a part of my show, but it's a part of my, my life mission. I'm 52, almost 53. I'll be 53 by the time we're together. Oh, wow. and, and so every year, that commitment to acrobatic longevity is is really takes a different focus because my goal is to be able to do a standing back tuck at 60 years old and so far i'm pretty on track for that so uh yeah life is good well we better book that for asi chicago uh, you know whatever year that what may be we definitely want that let's to do be, it uh, um, now at this year's asi chicago you'll be speaking about how to achieve high performance sales goals uh, i believe this is something that you you have talked about in the past some that you are very familiar with. What do you remember from your first sale? And, and what would you do differently now that you have all this experience? Yeah, the, uh, when I saw that question, it really took me back. Because the question is, well, where do you start thinking about your first sale? You know, I was, I was selling back when I was, um, you know, a newspaper kid when I growing up in the city of Chicago in 57th and Pulaski in a little Polish neighborhood or helping my mom out. My mom's an artist. And she was an entrepreneur. She would sell her artwork at different fairs and festivals all over Chicagoland. So I would I would help her um, with her with her bo her booth selling her artwork. And then I started performing, right? And then I became a performer at the at a Renaissance festival, which is an incredible education in selling because you get have to literally gather a crowd to stand around while you do a show. And at the end of every show you pass the hat and you ask for money and it, you know, and you do that six times a day. Wow. And so you get really good at pushing through that discomfort of, uh, and finding a way to articulate your value. And so for me, I think looking back on every stage of my evolution as a, as a performer, as a speaker, as a consultant, as a coach, as an expert, who comes alongside my partners, you know, and we've all heard that before you can sell your products, you, what you're really first selling is yourself. And in my case, my product is myself. Yeah. Like I have to convince you that I'm the right guy for the job. And so what I probably would tell myself prior to this is to relax into that conversation more naturally. You, we all approach it, I think initially from the idea of I have to overcome a bar. I have to overcome a hurdle. I have to prove that I'm enough for my buyer to be convinced or my customer or client to be convinced that they want to work with me. And, and the reality is you don't have to prove it. You, you, you have nothing to prove. You have so much to share. 
to give, to, uh, to, to provide in terms of value. And when you show up for your customers in a way that really is, is aligned to their goals and needs, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here because in the promotional products business, that's what the job is. It's right. Like, how do you truly demonstrate you get it? You understand this isn't just a product. This is something that serves a purpose and it helps you to drive a goal. And, you know, some of that's experience because you can only have that conversation at a higher level once you've already had it at a lot of lower levels. But you can also shorten that learning curve quite a bit. So I would just step in more confidently to your uniqueness, to trust the value of your perspective and your expertise because you have so much to share. I feel like that covers uh, my final question for you as well because, you know, I, I, you can relate to this when you had to break through that uncomfort ability about asking people six times a day to, you know, and, and to explain your value with the economy mm -hmm. rebounding, people are going to be hearing about more price objections than, than ever before. You know, in addition to what you said, do you have any other advice for promotional product salespeople on how to overcome these price objections? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do because it's not just about, you know, I, I try to reframe it as I have to overcome a price objection. No, you just have to transcend it. You have to get through that part of the conversation. Because look, if they're not asking you for a better price, they're not doing their job. That's part of the conversation. Right. It's not an objection. It's just a natural response. And we should all be prepared for it, right? If they're not, they're, they're not asking you for a better deal, they're not doing their job and they're not responsible to the people above them in terms of their leadership and their management. So... But again, if you're not doing your job, which is making the case for value, uh, then you're not going to uh, reciprocate in the same way. So it's a matter of understanding your value and understanding, look, you know, we have to get it right. What, one of the things the pandemic has taught us all is that we have to get it right the first time, that we don't have time to go back and fix mistakes that were made because we tried to cut corners that we don't want to do business with people we don't enjoy doing business with or people who don't truly understand our needs. So what we say, and honestly, we sell even our digital events at a much higher price point than most of my competition. Okay. And so we've constantly had to make the case for why that's justified. And, and what I say is, look, we get one chance to get this right. You want to, because it's not just about what the price is that you get from me. It's about the total investment of your meeting. If, you're, if your meeting falls flat because you hired the wrong speaker, then everything else is discounted as well. And so when you think about the product that you're selling or the service or the relationship that you're selling, we've got to take it from this commoditized discussion about a thing and take it to a bigger picture or concept of what this thing does in their world. And again, when you articulate that you get that, that you understand, look, it's bigger than just this, this thing we're talking about here, um, and, and make the case that, look, going forward, are you going to have this same price conversation, this adversarial relationship every single time, or do you want someone you can trust who understands, yes, of course, price is important, but value is so much more important. And when I understand the value that I bring to the equation, then price becomes, um, it, it's still, a, it's still a, a conversation that has to be had, but it's, it may not be the most important criteria of whether or not this is the right decision. Gotcha. I mean, it, these, are, these are tremendous insights, and as, as you always provide, and you mm -hmm. will be bringing them to ASI Chicago, and it's going to be uh, July 14th, People can get their tickets now. Dan, we are looking forward to have you back. With, with you coming back to an ASI show, I think that gives everybody a sense of returning to normalcy. You know, you're such a staple of these events that uh, we are just looking forward to this, man. And thank you for taking the time today. John, I am delighted. Thank you for your time. And see you, see you all there. You got it. Have a good one. Bye now.